I get started any further, I, there's a couple little business things that I want to share with you that we're going to pass out. Because um, some of you are going to leave early and don't feel offended. They've already told me they have various meetings that start, and maybe some of them at 7.30 or so. So uh, before they leave, I want, we put together a little handout on the latest way to look for a job or internships is on following Twitter accounts of different organizations. So we focus a little research on media and writing careers. So if you would pass those around and take one of those if you're interested. The other plug that Denise and I are going to make will give you a little sheet is that we do have an internship fair coming up October the 5th. And I'd love you to make sure that that's on your agenda to check out as well. And you might be able to find places to use your writing skills at the internship fair. Okay, so who would like to go first? Oh, not it. Oh, not it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll start. How about with Veronica? Oh, before I forget how to pronounce your last name, which is? Well, we, yeah, how do you Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I, was, well, I knew if I waited too long, I'd forget. Well, you can see she's had a very impressive resume so far because she um, has applied those English skills and a minor in philosophy. Very good. Uh, and she works at USC at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. Um, but one of her memories that she liked to share when she came to Whittier College, uh, she actually got her start at the QC. And she was an editor at the QC, and that's one of her best memories for getting this professional jump start into this career. Um, unfortunately, because the way the QC schedule is, lots of QC people wanted to be here tonight, but they're getting a paper out that comes out tomorrow, so they're not here. Um, but I'm glad we have one representative. Thank you for coming. All right, <coughs> so why don't you share with us your path? Um, well, first of all, I know that uh, that a couple people mentioned journalism, but I was just kind of curious, a show of hands, who here is is thinking about journalism, or is, is that an option for anybody? That's good. That warms my heart. <laughs> um, okay, I just have a couple notes, but. Um, so uh, just a really brief background. Um, I was an English major, and I basically chose English because I had more units in English than any other, uh, any other major. I changed my major about five times while I was at Whittier. I, went, I was a geology major. I was a philosophy major. I was um, theater and education. And I, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I kind of still don't. But, um, but one of the things that I knew I liked was I liked to write, and I liked talking to people, and I liked meeting people, and I liked telling people stories, and I think that's kind of why journalism was such a great fit for me. And I started on the Quaker campus, um, and it was a great experience, and, um, and I kind of, I was one of the lucky ones when I graduated. I was able to apply for a job at a very small community paper in LA, and, um, and I, got, I got the job. And I think the Quaker campus background was definitely what, what helped me. Um, and I know that this, uh, this forum is to kind of figure out how people kind of get into their career paths, but I don't exactly think that how I got into journalism is relevant for anybody else who wants to get into journalism because journalism has changed so much. I mean, it's changed, even within the past year, it's changed dramatically, and especially, you know, 10 years ago when I got started in it. Um, it's a totally different medium. So um, just to get back into my background, I, I worked in PR, I was a book publisher, I worked in nonprofit development, and I basically realized that if I wanted to do what I wanted to do, I needed to go back to school, so I went to USC and I got a, a master's in, uh, in media studies through their Annenberg School of Communication, and, uh, and now I work there. And I think what I love about it is that um, now as a researcher, I get to study what I was involved in. So as part of, I, I work for a think tank. So we study media, entertainment, communication, pop culture. I mean, it's it really is a very wide spectrum of interests. And it's given me the opportunity to kind of look at the industry of journalism and communication, look at the business models, figure out what's working and what isn't working. And, um, and there are a lot of people right now who are talking about journalism as a, as a dying field, and I'm not one of them. I don't think it's dying. I think it's as vibrant as ever. I think it's evolving and it's changing. And I think that um, one, of the, one of the ways that it's changing is you've got this, this new medium of the internet, which has basically changed the way newspapers work. Um, but, the, but the problem, what the issue is, is that 
the internet needs content. And so if you're able to provide content, you'll have a place somewhere online. And you'll be able to make a living doing it. It's, it's a different business model. And I think the fun thing about getting into it right now is that there are no rules. I mean, newspapers are, are even trying to figure out how to, how to work it. So if you are interested in it and you want to pursue it, it's, you can kind of create how you want to pursue it. Um, another thing I, I do want to say is that it's not so much about content anymore. It's, uh, I mean, it's not so much about print. So if you're a good writer, that's great, and that's huge, and that's going to take you far. But it's also about multimedia, and it's about you know understanding what makes a good story, um, video, audio, podcasts. Um, it's, it's a very creative environment, and one that I... I love being involved in and think that there's a lot of promise and, and future there for people who want to be involved in it too. Um, there was one article that came out a while ago talking about journalism and, um, and kind of how it's changing and they actually listed a couple of job descriptions that exist now that didn't exist a year ago and I just wanted to read a couple of them because I just thought they were so fascinating but um, so. oh okay so, uh, like for example, uh, headline optimizer was one of them. So, understanding you know what makes a good headline, real, really understanding how the internet is a vibrant part of newspapers and journalism, and um, and trying to get get eyeballs. I mean, it all it's all about a competition for eyeballs now. Um, story scientists. So it's about uh, investigating data to make digital content. Um, a curator in chief. So trying to figure out how you, you know, what's gonna what's gonna draw people to your site. Um, a viral meme checker, which I thought was a really <laughs> cool one. So um, basically, you're 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 trying to link get people to link to your site and, and draw again draw more eyeballs. Um, a, an ebook creator, which is another way to go. I think that. Um, I think that there's an audience out there, it's very different, it's very fragmented, and there's, if you have a, a niche that you're interested in, I think there, that's also a great way to go, journalism-wise, or just writing-wise, because there, like I said, there is such a tremendous need for content, and for good content, so um, it's, all, it's all about kind of making your own way, so uh, hopefully if you're not interested in journalism, maybe you can, you know, you can still be a part of it in some way, there are a lot of online sites that, like, um, Patch and Spotify, where uh, people are kind of like free agents, so they're no longer working for newspapers, but they're kind of working on their own and trying to distribute content through various means. Um, so anyway, it's, a, it's an exciting industry and one that I'm happy to be a part of and happy to study and, and think that there's a future in it, regardless of what other people say. Uh, we're going to probably wait and have questions at the end. Um, but given that some people might be taking oxygen, would anyone like to ask for a question right now? I did pass um, out some potential questions. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, what classes, or like what techniques or um, trades, I don't know how to say it, what do, what do I need to know how to do before I get into this business? Like, like web design, is that a must, do you think, for right now? Um, I don't know what necessarily web design is. I think having an understanding of communication technologies is huge. I mean, one of the reasons why I got a job outside of, uh, after the Quaker campus was I knew uh, Quark, which is probably now InDesign, but I knew Quark, and, and they were looking for somebody who no, not only knew how to write, but knew how to lay out a paper. And so just having an arsenal of different skills is, is definitely vital. And also just, like I said, communication technologies, social media. I mean, if you're not on Twitter, you should be, and, and you should learn about it, or Tumblr, or other things like that, so that you can kind of see how, it's not so much about writing the content, but it's about pushing the content out to people. It's a lot harder to find content now than it was a few years ago, so I think that's important. Anybody else? Okay, well, let's just do ladies first then tonight, all right. So, uh, Genevieve Haynes is, also has very impressive uh, background that she has applied her political science and English, right? Double major. Genevieve works for her own company now, but if you want to read how she got there, because that doesn't happen overnight, <laughs> you can read all the background of all the steps that she took to uh, gain experiences. 
And Genevieve's fond memory of Whittier when she was here was how strikingly different the diversity experience was from where she grew up in Washington. And uh, so her living arrangement, which at the time was a house for society, the Athenians had their own house? Yeah. Oh, Thalian, sorry. Okay. The Thalians did have their own living arrangements. So she was uh, a Norwegian-American, a Mexican-American, African-American, and your first Jewish friend, all living together. <laughs> first right? Jewish friend. <laughs> all right. Well, so why don't you go ahead and tell us, and I think I forgot to mention at the beginning that each of you have about 10 minutes. Um, and part of the reason why that house was so exciting is after I left Whittier, I went to do a lot of health equity and education equity issues with the state of California. So it made me much more sensitive to how we are in Los Angeles. And if you're not doing work in diversity in Los Angeles, you're not doing very good outreach in general. So it's a great opportunity to get to know a lot of different kinds of people at Whittier, and it's a very special part, I think, about the college. So um, I'm going to talk about my career in three phases because I've worked um, in an agency, which is, there are really three main areas where people in public relations work, and there are some other ones, but the main ones are within an agency, a PR agency that has a lot of different kinds of accounts, um, within in-house, so that's working for a company on staff that helps uh, do public relations for the organization, and then third as an independent consultant, which is what I'm doing now. So I'm going to walk through those three phases, and then I'm going to weave in my five tips for public relations people. <laughs> Very PR approach to it. So um, we'll go through the lessons learned. So first of all, when I graduated, I um, did not want to move back home with my parents. So I tried to get a job right out of college. So a few months before I graduated, I went to the Career Center, and I got a list of the biggest PR firms in Los Angeles. And at the time, you had to go and find a piece of paper because the internet wasn't what it is now. It took a lot more work to research it. But I took that name of the top 20 PR firms in five buildings in Los Angeles. And I um, did a cover letter and a resume and I sent it to all of them. I didn't know if there was any jobs there, but it, that just didn't matter. It was because uh, most jobs, as you know, aren't listed. So if I could get my resume in when people were starting to think about adding positions, then I would be in a better position than waiting for an ad and having a million people turn in their, their uh, resume. So I ended up getting a couple of interviews and I started at a firm pretty much a couple days after graduation. Uh, and I ended up staying for 10 years. Um, so the first tip for PR person is uh, pay your dues in the beginning when you're first starting out. Because in the beginning when you're doing an entry level job, which is in an agency, you're not doing fun, exciting, glamorous work. It's not like TV shows when they have PR people on the TV shows. You're doing a lot of monitoring. You're checking to see where your clients are showing up on in social networks. Um, media, on TV, you're reporting that up to the client, you're filing, you're making Xerox copies, you're building um, materials to get out, you've got boxes of collateral, we call it, but um, uh, you know the things that they give out, the charge fees that they give out, that's the kind of work that you do in the beginning, or that's the kind of work that I was doing because I was the lowest member of the total poll on our, the account team. So the, pay your dues early so that you can start building <laughs> some uh, uh, earning some responsibility to do some of the more exciting things because it does get better, but just be pre prepared to do it and do it early so you get it out of the way and you can start working on some fun stuff. So it kind of leads into the second, my second tip for PR people, which is make er make sure every project that you work on is awesome. Right? Go work on you, you're too good to be working on non-awesome projects. So make sure every single project you work on is awesome. And if it's not awesome, figure out how to make it awesome because this is the kind of how you're building your experience, you're building your resume, you're building what people are knowing you by, by how you do the work. So for example, when you do, when I was doing uh, monitoring, it was a matter of figuring out ways to make the reports better, right? How can I use technology, which a lot of people weren't really that interested in at the time, how can I use that to make reports better? How can I use it to make, get, take less time so maybe I could get some writing assignments? How can I, and then uh, look at how you can build it. And somebody mentioned Tony the Tiger. So, um, most of my work I do, I kind of like a, I like to do goody stuff, so I do a lot of health and a lot of education work. Um, but I did do some work for Kellogg and some work for Albertson. When I was working for Albertsons, we had a, an event that we needed local celebrities for, and we couldn't end up finding any local celebrities. So um, we ended up talking to um, Father Joe. Does anyone know Father Joe? Anyone from San Diego? Yeah. San Diego? Yeah. Okay, he's a very well-known charitable um, leader. And he ended up saying he could do this event with us. 
this event was Supermarket Sweep. Does people know what Supermarket Sweep is, the TV show? Okay, so he said he would agree to it. So we ended up going back to the client and saying, all right, let's do Supermarket Sweep with the clergy. And that idea was so different and exciting, it turned into an awesome project that ended up getting a lot of national media coverage. So this was a small event that we ended up getting a lot of coverage on. They were even mounting cameras onto the shopping carts and the priests were running around. <laughs> and so Albuquerque has got an incredible return on that event. Um, but that's because we, we tried to figure out how to make it an event awesome. So that's number two. So after that I decided, um, I had a baby and I decided to uh, take three years off. And during that time, I spent a lot of time doing online classes. So I did online classes in web development, HTML coding, um, and uh, Photoshop, any kind of online class that had to do with technology stuff. So when I went back, uh, three years later, I decided I want to go back to work. So I went back to my network. I talked to the people that I had worked with. So make sure you keep in touch with the people you worked with. And two of the people that I worked with had gone to UCLA. I ended up going to UCLA and getting a job as director of integrated communications there. And because of the time that I had spent, the three years I had spent just doing online classes around technology, I was really well positioned to be able to help them build their social uh, media presence. And that was significant because they had a lot of people there who didn't have any skills in that area. So within two years, we had built up YouTube um, and Facebook and, and Twitter. Uh, for Google started using UCL as a case study. We started doing um, having coverage in the Wall Street Journal. So we ended up being able to turn that into an awesome project as well. So that's point number three. Do whatever you can to stay on top of technology. We talked about that a little bit before, but, but it's absolutely critical because it's very easy to fall behind. And if you can stay ahead of it, you're going to be so valuable in this environment. My one caveat about that is that it's one thing to know how to do it. It's another thing to know how to build it so it supports business goals. So if you know how to set up a Twitter account, that's great. If you can tell people how you can do Twitter to be able to support business goals, you're going to be incredibly valuable to that organization and incredibly valuable in the marketplace because the amount of people who can do that right now is really slim and the industry is changing so much that staying ahead of it is going to be huge. So I was there for um, two and a half years and then decided to uh, go out on my own to work with a lot of different companies. Um, and I do a lot of web writing. So for the English people, it's very really web writing. It's very different than other kinds of writing that you do. Um, so my uh, third, fourth tip for PR people is read everything. The more you read, the better you write. It's very across all you know, nodding like that. So, um, so if you can um, pick up whatever, if you find Crazy Magazine on the magazine stand, pick that up. Um, read literature. Um, when I was getting ready for this presentation, I emailed a lot of my colleagues and I put out on Twitter looking for advice. That's the kind of advice that came back is read, read, read. And not just to improve your writing, but also that you're able to talk to more people about things if you know more. So um, read The Hunger Games, read <laughs> in New Yorker, read uh, everything that you can. Um, and then uh, five, as I'm on my own, uh, it's really important for me that most of my business comes from referrals. So it's people that I've worked with before. That's where I get my projects now. So know what builds your brand, know what you're really good at, find those kinds of projects so you're not in a position of working on stuff that you're not that good at. If you're really good at media relations, figure out how you can do a lot of media relations and become an expert in that. Um, and then be sure to be in touch with those people that you work with. Try to find out ways that you can keep in touch with them because as you can see, um, most of my jobs are come that way. So that's my experience in the job. Okay, moving on to the gentlemen. All right, we'll go and see the bookends over here, right here. Um, this is Kevin Perez, and he uh, he came to see me when he was an undergrad, which is good advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he actually is a very unique uh, place in his life right now. But before he shares with you what he's currently doing, which is kind of um, a good use of communication skills, and hopefully there's even more substance behind your excellent communication skills, right? Because he's running for political office. Here. Uh, he does think that part, one of the things that he remembers that kind of helped give him a positive 
uh, push in the right direction was he's also a QC writer. Were you editor? I was or, not. I was uh, an opinion columnist. But that opinion of his was well expressed, <laughs> and he ended up getting um, a fellowship. Was it Bobby Stoll? Yeah. You said, and that was for his in-depth analysis in his opinion um, on local things and national topics as well, and right? Controversial things. And things controversial. That made people very angry at me. Oh, yes. What you? <laughs> you and Eric actually have something very similar. Oh, I'll share Eric's later. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, currently, I am running for political office. I'm running for state assembly uh, in the Whittier area, which includes Whittier and a few surrounding uh, cities. So, but before that, what I was doing was public relations. So I'm kind of right in there with Genevieve. Uh, I've been part of a very specific part of public relations, though, which we call crisis management and crisis communications. Um, being the political geek that I was uh, growing up, and I, I want to say still am, uh, I've always been attracted to what is the problem? You know, what's going on? How do we fix this? How do we spin this into something positive? How do we spin something negative and positive? Um, when I was here at Whittier, uh, I worked with uh, Dana Ricosi. I don't know if any of you guys know her. She's the director of public relations. She, I would, I would absolutely consider her my mentor. She's one of the most brilliant public relations minds I've ever met. She, if you have any questions PR related, aside from Genevieve or myself, I would absolutely recommend uh, going to Dana. Um, but after that, I worked for uh, my first job out of college was for Blywise Communications, which is. Uh, a PR firm over in Calabasas, but they deal with the labor unions. And I went in right as there was a strike, right as there was a supermarket strike. And because there had been strikes only a couple years prior, the public support wasn't as wasn't as, as strong as it had been uh, previously. Uh, before, people weren't crossing the picket lines. There was demonstrations in favor. Uh, this time, not so much. This time, it was a lot of we're going to shop there anyways. We don't care. These people are selfish. These it was right after uh, George Bush got elected, or not too far after that, and you know the, the sentiment wasn't incredibly pro-union. Um, so what we did was we decided to, instead of focusing on, oh, these unions are fighting for their benefits, they're fighting for their health privileges, uh, we decided to go straight to the human interest stories. So we took families that were majorly affected by the strike, families that, you know, if the rates went up, they wouldn't be able to afford uh, health benefits. And so we really went in that, we wrote a lot of great stories about it, uh, got a lot of good press coverage, and it kind of swayed public opinion in our favor. Um, they ended up getting a great contract, uh, I think just recently, actually, they, two days ago, they got a new contract uh, without having to strike, which is good. Um, so after Blywise, I worked for the city of Pico Rivera, uh, which is actually the city I grew up in, um, right next door. And uh, that was... There was a lot of crisis in that as well. Uh, it seems like it either follows me or I brought to it. I'm not sure. Um, hopefully, if I get elected, it doesn't follow me. Uh, but uh, there was crisis in there because there was a, for lack of a better term, there was a, a rather corrupt city council in place at the time. They're, they're all gone now. But uh, And there was a lot of issues with the Chamber of Commerce in Pico. And so I was kind of the liaison between the city council and the Chamber of Commerce. and. I was in the middle of the he said, she said, so it was, no, 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 they didn't mean this when they said it publicly, they meant this. You know, I'd go back, no, 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 they're not upset about this, they just want that, you know. And um, it was a little stressful, that was a little more than what I, I prefer, but uh, it was interesting, nonetheless, and uh, in the end, everything worked out because the key players who kind of led it to that, the demise of the city almost, uh, were gone at that point. Um, most recently, I worked with uh, Assemblywoman Holly Mitchell, uh, who's over in the 47th District, which would be Crenshaw, Inglewood, Culver City uh, area. Um, not the most um, socioeconomically advantaged uh, area, but a um, very good area nonetheless. And I was in charge of a lot of her communications, and, and Holly's very much a mild personality, so I didn't really have to deal with what... with. Uh, much in the way of crisis management, but uh, at the same time, you know, we had issues with the NRA. Um, I don't know if we have a lot of Republicans here today, but uh, the, the NRA is, uh, is very powerful, and uh, she voted no on one of the bills, on an open carry bill, and we got bombarded, we got death threats, we had a bomb threat in our, our building, um, which was uh, a fun afternoon, I didn't have lunch until 5 o'clock. Uh, that was, yeah. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, and 
and since then, you know, I've kind of I've done a lot of uh, I've done a lot of independent PR. So I'll find small businesses, um, a lot of contacts, a lot of people that I've worked with previously uh, who like my work, who like my writing ability, which I was able to hone working for the QC and working as a PR intern for under Dana Raposi. Um, and so I've been able to take little jobs like that as well. And you know, you charge a small stipend, and, and it's. Um, it's interesting. It's not necessarily the level of uh, running your own business, but it's uh, it's fun nonetheless, and it's nice to have to be able to make your own schedule. Um, I do have a permanent retainer uh, right now that I'm, I'm utilizing, which is a company called World Challenge. Um, they send groups of high school kids on expeditions all over the world, um, mostly to third world and developing nations. Uh, there's always a service project involved, as well as uh, you know rest and relaxation, but also hex. Uh, Hikes through the jungle and you know, through the Amazon or the Nile or things like that. It's it's uh, it's really interesting, but it's it's a lot of fun to be able to work with that company. Um, and yeah, and that's uh, this point is where you see me now. So, shorter journey than those before me. But got a few years on it. <laughs> So when you fail to make it in the academic world, what is your 
master's degree, your PhD really going to be worth? And the answer is nothing. Um, I have a master's degree in philosophy from the University of Missouri. And what gets me hired time after time after time, I didn't, I don't know if I mentioned this by the way, but I'm a freelance writer. Um, I write anything and everything that people throw at me. I write for the web, I write um, product copy, I write for catalogs, I write for webs, I write news-ish stuff for websites, I write analysis stuff for websites, I write, um, right now I'm writing, uh, I guess you would call them like how-to stories and columns <laughs> for um, unemployed people. So, I mean, it's, it's I don't know, I, I write a lot. I, get, I, I cover a, a huge range of, of things. Um, and what gets me hired time after time after time is the QC. So, um, they're, for some reason, they're not impressed by my ability to analyze, you know, David Hume's take on causality. <laughs> but they're, they are impressed by my ability to, you know, pound out a 500 word story in an hour. Or, um, they're, you know, my ability to uh, lay out stories on InDesign, my ability to correct photos in Photoshop, all of these skills I learned at the QC. And that's what gets me hired. So I saw there was a lot of freshmen and sophomores here. <coughs> my, I guess what you should take away from this, aside from, for the love of God, don't go to grad school, <laughs> is you really owe it to yourself to head over to the QC office um, and, you know, even if you don't want to be on the editorial staff, which I was, um, just writing a story here and there. Um, I know they usually need writers and, <laughs> yeah, they usually need writers and um, just knowing how to, know, you know, knowing journalistic style, um, how not to how not to libel yourself, um, and how to, how to write a story quickly and well and get to the point is a huge thing in, in people who are looking for writers. Um, so I'm just going to go over a couple of reasons quickly because you don't, I know you don't believe me about not going to grad school, but I'll tell you. Um, a couple of reasons not to go to grad school is that it's expensive. Um, you can end up, you know, Whittier is very expensive. This school is, compared to, you know, big state schools, this is an expensive place to go. And you guys all know that. But um, grad school, that's adding at least, you know, $20,000 debt on top of that. Um, it's time consuming. A master's degree takes three years, um, more or less. PhD, anywhere from five to 10, depending on. Um, and honestly, it doesn't teach you how to write better. Because when you go to grad school, your professors expect you to know how to write at an above college level. They expect you to, to know what you're doing, so they don't teach you how to write. Um, and honestly, I'll, I've said it before and I'll say it again, Employers aren't impressed by a master's degree. They're impressed by um, how much experience you have, paying your dues, exactly what Genevieve said. <laughs> um, they're impressed. They're impressed by what you're able to do, not what not what you've already done educationally, or what you have, what you're theoretically able to do because of your education. Um, Another reason to write for the QC is because what really, what really impresses employers is when you come in there with clips, with published clips, a file of stories or uh, descriptions or whatever kind of copy that you've written that's been published by someone that's not you. Um, employers love that because that means, because that tells them that you know how to deliver under deadline, and quality enough that they, that they feel comfortable putting it out there. So, 
Um, a good place to get your start doing that is at the QC. If you can't write at the, if you don't have the time or your, or you know whatever to write at the QC, blogging is another way, good way to do it. Um, especially if you are really into something or really know something about something specific. Starting a blog about it is a great way to get your name out there, to show people that you can gain following, and to show people that you have not only expertise, but also the ability to communicate about it um, intelligently. Um, another thing you can do to really get, to really get yourself ahead as a, as a freelancer, if you want to go that way, is to intern. Um, I did one internship during my time here. I worked with uh, I worked with a Second Amendment attorney who had argued before the Supreme Court a couple of times. Um, he was the author of about a dozen books, and honestly, employers aren't impressed by that. Either. Um, the the internship just bounces right off them when I tell them about it. But what they but what they do like and um, what does impress them is that that internship led directly to my first national magazine publication. Um, and that they, they eat up. So, work, you know, I would say, for those of you who are freshmen and sophomores, every summer, at the very least, from here on out, try to get an internship. Try to, and, you know, explore your options. There's a lot of different ways, there's a lot of different things you can do with the ability to write. Um, you can go into PR, you can go into communications, you can go into journalism. Just try them all out. You know, see what's out there. I know, um, I mean, a lot of, like, fashion places, a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of fashion design and design, you know, industrial design type places here in, in L.A., and they are hiring writers like crazy. Um, if you like celebrity gossip, there, I mean, good God, just the number of, the number of celebrity gossip websites in L.A. is ridiculous. They're always looking for interns and photographers, well, not necessarily photographers, that's a whole different thing, but people who know how to do content management and correct photos, I mean, they love people like that. Um, so, and that's kind of where, I, that's, that's kind of where I'd like to end, well, not quite end up, but broad range of skills is the next big thing to have. Um, knowing how to do layout on InDesign, knowing how to correct photos, Knowing how to interview effectively, knowing um, how to knowing how to write in, in the numerous different styles is a huge thing, um, because there are differences between Chicago and AP, and the people you're interviewing with don't know what they are. If you do, that puts you ahead of them, and that gives you the kind of skill that they're that they're looking for. Um, and again. I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep hitting the QC because really I'm not I'm not kidding when I say that's what gets me hired every single time is my is my newspaper experience not only because I wrote but because I edited and because I managed a pool of contributors there so I've got like this great trifecta of skills I picked up at the QC also you almost you might get in a fight which is a good way to <laughs> show your stuff. Um, I, and I mean, I guess the last piece of wisdom I would leave you with is, it happens to me, it happens to me occasionally, and it's happened to every other writer that I kind of know, that you have these moments where, especially if you're a freelancer, you have these moments where work is really, work is really hard to come by, and you find yourself laying awake at night wondering if you made the right choice going into writing. Because, really, it's just writing. Where do you get off charging people for it, right? Um, but the secret that you might not know going to Whittier is that nobody knows how to write. People are terrible writers. Everybody. Um, not, I would say 90% of the people I have met professionally, and this includes some writers, um, just they just don't know how to string a sentence together. They don't know how to construct a paragraph. And God help you if you try to write one, read one of their actual, you know, <laughs> long form essays. And that, to me, is really the benefit of coming to Whittier College. That you cannot get out of this place without having to write a million papers. I mean, 
every class you're in here, you have to write a final paper, a midterm. You, I mean, it's just ridiculous, especially if you're an English major. These guys are brutal. <laughs> so, um, coming to Whittier gives you a huge advantage right there. But being a, but you know, practicing writing by blogging, by working for the QC, by just putting out as many things as you can on the web or whatever, it, it's a huge advantage over everyone else in the job market. Um, I think this is probably more directed to Veronica, but like I said before, I'm a marketing and visual communications major and um, working on my senior project, just looking for any resources that I can, um, you know, do you know of any conferences or links where I can find conferences in the LA area that might help with um, web development, web design? Oh, I mean, there's tons of professional organizations that you could definitely hook up with, and, and they have mentoring <coughs> programs as well. I can't think of any right now, but I'll, let me talk to you after. Okay, I can that'd be great. There's an organization called Digital LA that does a lot of events okay. around Los Angeles, but they webcast a lot of them on a site called TechZulu. So you may want to check out TechZulu and see some of their, um, they do, uh, it's digital, so a lot of it's in the industry digital, but also websites and other people can learn it. Veronica brings up a really good point about professional associations. So while you're a student, many professional associations have a student rate, which is very reasonable to join, and then you get to uh, rub elbows with people who are in the profession that you're interested in, and they can hook you up with mentors or internships and learn more about uh, the types of things that that profession focuses on at their professional development luncheons and things like that. After you graduate, it's a lot more expensive to join, even if you're unemployed. <laughs> you still have to pay the full rate. So it's really advantageous of you to join when you're still an undergrad and have that opportunity. I would actually say, um, adding on to that, actually, PRSA, the Public Relations uh, Society of America, their student rate is actually great compared to what you pay once you're actually uh, out in the working world. Um, they do have requirements if you don't join as a student, you decide to join after, is you do have to be working in PR in some capacity, whether in-house or uh, <coughs> agency. So it's best to kind of get in there with, if you have an interest in PR, it's best to get in there as a student. I just read my membership today. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, um, for Genevieve, you're talking about how most of your stuff is on a referral now. Mm -hmm. So how important is networking just in general? Or just all of your guys, just like, you try to make as many friends as you can? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, there's, a, there's a great book I would recommend called uh, Never Eat Alone. It does talk about networking, but in a, in a real authentic way. I don't think that the old model of throwing business cards with people is really relevant, but it's being able to um, build, uh, normally the way that I work with, try to keep in touch with the people that I've worked with, um, and in meaningful ways, and that's been made a big difference. Else? Oh, I would say also everybody should have a LinkedIn account. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely have a LinkedIn account. That's how they track you down. Yeah. <laughs> have as, make it look good and have as many connections there, on there as you possibly can. Join as many groups as you can. Um, you know, there are things related to your school. You know, the Woodrow <coughs> College Alumni Association is on there. But anything PR related, join LinkedIn. Uh, who knows what LinkedIn is? So it is like the professional Facebook. <laughs> it's only, the content's a little different and you have to manage it a little differently than you do, but it is uh, the professional person's way to connect with people. So when they say get a LinkedIn account, uh, that is a very different kind of thing than you're used to, but related. There's, there's far less hooking up on LinkedIn. A lot more job. I have one more question, probably for Genevieve and Veronica, but anybody else, obviously. Um, uh, you, you were mentioning that, um, Genevieve, that you took online classes for HTML, and I'm definitely more of a visual person. I worked for the QC for a little while. I was really involved with my high school's yearbook, which is actually where I learned InDesign and layouts and everything. But how advantageous do you think it is for 
for somebody going into the marketing field to know HTML and also kind of visual design? Because I know at the company I worked at last summer, there are two totally separate departments. So I'm not sure if every company is like that, but I saw there are a lot of miscommunications and the design people don't understand you know, how to build a website and the HTML people don't understand you know, why what designers want things to look a certain way. So do you <coughs> think that there are positions, you know, that um, two together? I'm really glad that you brought that up because that's a huge part of this transition is there are a lot of designers who don't know how to do web and a lot of times the people who know how to do the web aren't, uh, you know, are more comfortable working with data and code. Um, I, I learned that it, it has helped me when I work in, even in WordPress, which is a content management system that helps you update websites, but even even doing something as simple as that, being able to look at the back end, to look at the code, and to see what's happening in it, right. then a, a lot of what I do right now is I'm a liaison between those people. So I work with a lot of people who are hardcore coders, and I work with people who are, you know, run universities and departments, and so I try to help the two people understand each other, okay. and that's where you can really, really make a difference, because there's not a lot of people that can do that really well. So I don't Code. I would <laughs> I do everything I can to avoid right. coding when I have to. I'll do it, but I, you know, I, that's not what I want to do. But being able to speak that language right. makes a huge difference in being able to get things done. So, um, so I think for me it was really valuable, uh, and it, it gave me skills that, that uh, a lot of people uh, it's not there are less common, I guess. Right. And I would add that um, being able to put together an article or you know whatever kind of content you're you're writing is a big part of the job, but people who, I mean, hi, people who hire are also looking for people who are able to not only write it, but also post it. And if you know, I mean, even if you know just basic HTML tweaks, mm -hmm. that's huge. Like they, cool. exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> even if you just know, I mean, even if you just know tags, that's something that, that's something that employers are looking for. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the people who, the people who hire are further along in their careers, and they don't have to learn that kind of stuff. So they don't, they don't know it. Um, so even you know, even if you just have, you know, one step above, no experience, it's a huge thing. Right. And how how do you label that on your resume? You know, be like HTML beginner. Um, you how can you uh, one way. Uh, you could list uh, courses that you've taken. So um, for me, I took it with Santa Monica College, okay. just online. So you could write, you know, HTML. Uh, I had a question about uh, niche writing. Like, uh, how would you guys uh, suggest being able to like break into that kind of industry? Like, for example, comedy writing, which is what I'm interested in. There's actually um, there are a lot of. I mean, I've got I've got a couple of friends who are comedy writers. Um, one of them actually writes for Conan, and <laughs> the way he broke in was to join a troupe. Um, if you can find like. I mean, not so much an improv troupe, but there are a couple of um, there are a couple of just comedy troops that need writers around the city. Sometimes they'll hire you as an intern. Um, sometimes, you know, they'll just do open submissions. Um, the first place you want, you really want to look those is Craigslist because somebody's always posting looking for funny writers on Craigslist. Um, and sometimes it's for something really dumb, like it's a, it's, it's, it'll be a dumb like startup website that's going to be dead in, in two months. But if you can find, a, I mean, if you can, if you can write something that they like, and then find a way to save it on your website, mm -hmm. that shows you know other perspectives that you do know how to write something funny. All right, thanks. Give my politics and be hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> comment on other internships that you've seen in your industry or seen other interns who have had experiences just to give people ideas of how that as a freshman or sophomore level they could get some exposure. I would say, um, I would actually say that because of your age and because of when you, where you guys are growing up, and bless you, and where you guys are growing up, um, you have a huge advantage in the social media realm. Yeah. Because you guys have grown up with, you know, five years ago MySpace, but now it's Facebook and Twitter and 
everything else. There's stuff that I don't even know anymore, you know, but uh, Google Plus is coming out, you know, just came out. And so you guys really have that advantage. Um, you're going to be pushing out people who are in their 50s and 60s in these same marketing, PR, communications type positions that are currently there because of what you guys know and because of your ability to adapt to the new market and the changing market trends as opposed to, you know, people who are working with Don Draper was, you know, the head of creative, you know, so. Um, so I think that's a really big advantage you guys have. So taking, looking for an internship, like, like Eric said, finding internships during the summer, um, even when you graduate, you know, I know you said you recently graduated, finding an internship as soon as possible, even if it's unpaid for the time being, it's highly likely that if you do a good job, it's going to lead to an entry level position with that company. That's a really good point because a lot of the internships that the people I work for are hiring for, they're looking specifically for people for the kids these days who know how to run the Facebooks and the Twitters um, because they don't. I mean, employers are looking for people with skills that they don't have. Um, and so if you know how to do that, social, exactly what he said, if, if you know how to do the social media stuff, um, work that angle and really advertise those skills. Just take down some of the pictures. Ha, ha, ha.